Hi, everybody. I am Nicole Mazer, the editor-in-chief of Scene Magazine. Um, I want to welcome you to our webinar on gut health and your whole body. I want to thank you all for being here this morning um, to hear more about an area of our body that's probably underappreciated, underestimated, um, but it shouldn't be. So in our January issue, we ran a story about how our gut health impacts all these different aspects of our bodies from our hearts to our immune systems, to our brains and beyond. Um, and it was fascinating to learn just how important your gut health is to overall wellness. Um, speaking of wellness, definitely an important topic right now. Um, not sure if you all noticed, but the past year has been just a little bit stressful. So the fact that we're all taking time out to learn about how to improve any aspect of our health is commendable. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Elizabeth Swinor, who leads the functional medicine program at the Henry Ford Center for Integrative Medicine. Dr. Ryan Gauthier, Gauthier, sorry. Um, he's a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. And Maria Conley, who's a registered dietitian dietitian nutritionist, nutri ugh, sorry, dietitian nutritionist who works with Dr. Swinor um, and her team at Henry Ford. So each of our panelists is gonna talk to you a little bit about gut health and the various aspects of it. Um, I'm going to play a short video after Dr. Swinor's presentation, and then we're going to let our other experts speak. And then as they're talking, if you guys have any questions, just pop them in the chat and we have a Q&A after, so we'll try to address as many of them as we can. Um, so I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to Dr. Swinor now. Take it away. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you very much to Scene Magazine for inviting um, our team to speak today. We're very excited about this opportunity, and Happy New Year to everyone in the audience. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, we'll address those at the end of the program today and let's have some fun here. Um, so um, as Nicole mentioned, um, I work at the functional medicine department um, at Henry Ford Hospital. And I'm board certified in family medicine, uh, plus have uh, several certifications in integrative medicine, metabolic and functional medicine and lifestyle medicine. And I'd like to start out today with just talking about, you know, what is functional medicine? This is a question that we get a lot. Um, less so than in the past because it's becoming much more common in a sought after um, medical specialty, but let's define it here for you today. Um, functional medicine is personalized patient-centered medicine, and what that means is that we focus um, on the patient as a central part of, the, of their care, and the patient drives um, how we evaluate them based on their um, myriad of symptoms that they may present with. And we look at the interconnectivity of all the body system, systems. So what that means is we look at how your heart communicates with your gut or your gut communicates with your kidneys and how your brain communicates with your kidneys, et cetera. So we try to look at the totality of you and deciding what our course of treatment or assessment would be. And then the ultimate question is, we ask, why was there a disease in the first place? What was the initiating factor that started the disease process? And that could go all the way back to early childhood, even though the disease doesn't present itself to perhaps your 30s, 40s, 50s, or even later in life. And functional medicine is an evidence-based systems approach that I was just talking about, how all of the body systems uh, interrelate to one another um, and, in, and are individualized to each patient. And we try to focus on what is causing uh, the, the disease process. And typically when we think of how we practice modern, modern medicine, um, medicine is uh, practiced within silos. So we have a cardiology department, a gastroenterology, dermatology, pulmonology, et cetera. And when you need to go see a specialist, then you will go to the appropriate specialist that you've been referred to. And family medicine, of course, as well as internal medicine, tries to encompass all of these uh, silos and then kind of navigate your treatment or referral base wherever you need to go. Uh, functional medicine uh, is much like family medicine, but broaden a little bit is that we try to focus all of you, 
um, your body systems, your mind, body, spirit, what is causing the disease, and also a big part of functional lifestyle medicine is working on prevention and trying to prevent the uh, further burden of the chronic disease, reverse it if we can, or prevent it from ever happening in the first place. And different uh, modes of assessment that we might look at, we might look at your immune system and how is that may or may not be dysfunctional, hormonal imbalances, nutritional deficiencies. Uh, a big portion of our uh, practice is digestive health, uh, chronic inflammation. Um, the word inflammation is a big buzzword these days. And what does inflammation mean? It, it means basically aberrant or abnormal uh, reactions that are taking place in the body that are like gasoline and a fire that continue to drive uh, the burden of a chronic disease. Um, there is some inflammation, however, that is healthy. Um, any sort of reaction in our body does give off inflammatory processes that, um, that the body is able to neutralize and don't go on to cause disease. However, when your body is overwhelmed with inflammation, that's when usually we see the onset of a, a disease, the onset of a disease and then the progression of the disease. Um, insulin resistance, a precursor to diabetes, and food allergies and sensitivities. So who is a functional medicine patient? Actually, everyone is. Um, children all the way through adulthood. And so what we're going to focus on today is getting to know your microbiome. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes actually defining what this is, because this may be a new term for some of you. So the microbiome. Um, are a collection of bacteria, or grouping or community of bacteria that live on you, they live within you, they live in your nose, your ears, your mouth, uh, your um, vaginal area, anal area, they live all over you and they also live inside of you. And the largest proportion of these bacteria reside in the gastrointestinal tract. Interesting that the genetic information that makes us up, which we call human, 90% of the genetic information actually belongs to these microbes, and only 10% of our genetic information actually is human. And they are very, very teeny tiny microscopic um, microorganisms. And if you put these microorganisms end to end, this is fascinating, that there's enough of them to travel around the world 2.5 times. That's just you, what's on you and within you. And how did you get these microbes? Um, you get them at birth. Uh, when you're born and you um, travel through the mother's vaginal canal, that wet um, liquid that the babies bathe in as it travels through the canal is teeming with microorganisms. And the microorganisms um, get in the baby's nose, ears, mouth, et cetera, and they're all over the baby's skin. And this immediately starts to um, promote the baby's immune system. Looks like we lost Dr. Sonor, but she's yeah. coming back. What happened? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. There we go. Um, are we all set, Nicole? Oh, I can't hear you. I can hear you. I don't see your presentation, though. Can you get it back up? Um, Maria. <laughs> OK, there we go. Let's see. Hold please for technical difficulties. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, I've actually lost the whole panel too, Nicole. Oh no. Um, Ashley, can you help? Yeah, if you hover around the bottom part of the screen, you should see a green um, screen share box with an yeah. arrow pointing up. Okay. I don't see that. I see it, but I'm not sharing. I don't have your Let's screen. See. Are you inside of the um, the Zoom window? So go to your Zoom, Dr. Swinor. Yep, yep. And then at the bottom, do you see where it says like participants, chat? Does it say that on the bottom of your screen? Mm -hmm. okay, there we go. There we go, fabulous. Your screen. Okay. And we're back, but where did? Yeah, know. where did? There we go. Is that? Is that? Can you see that screen now? I see bacteria. Yep, right back where we were. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Perfect. And we're back. 
All right, so we are talking about where do you get this microbiome? Sorry about that. Um, you get it at birth through the when you travel through the, the birth canal. And this microbiome is passed on from generation to generation from generation. So it's a very ancient lineage of bacteria that goes all the way back to the onset of mankind. We cannot survive without this bacteria. And obviously they um, cannot survive without us. And I'm using the word bacteria very generally there because actually the microbiome is made up of viruses, fungi, archaea, and bacteria. And we often refer to this as bacteria, but just so you know that these are friendly microorganisms and they are not just bacteria. It weighs about three pounds in totality. So it's like a suitcase that you're carrying with you for your entire life from birth to the end of your life. They're extremely sensitive to diet and we're gonna talk about that. And also very, very sensitive to our lifestyle choices. And they thrive primarily on plant-based foods and they are intimately involved in the progression of disease or the progression of wellness and health. And just like many communities that we have, we have uh, very friendly bacteria or microorganisms and we have some that are not so friendly that live side by side and a healthy gut has a great diversity of friendly bacteria. And you want the greatest population obviously to be friendly and not unfriendly. When the unfriendly bacteria or opportunistic bacteria such as salmonella or candida albicans, which is yeast, take over, then we start to see gut issues and um, disharmony in the bowel. And this is just a really cool slide to illustrate how immensely important the intestinal microbiota are. You can see that these are all two-way arrows that point in and point out uh, to all these different factors that influence the microbiota, but also what is the microbiota influence? It influences um, how, how, you're, how healthy you age, um, stress, brain, your immune system. Uh, the microbiota communicates directly with your immune system, which is so important right now during this uh, pandemic uh, that we are experiencing. The mi microbiota are involved in hormonal balancing. Um, exercise influences them. Um, antibiotics greatly influence the diversity of the microbiome and diet and your genetics are influenced and so on. And this slide also illustrates that we are really what we eat. Um, the, our food is broken down into microscopic particles, and then these microscopic nutrients are shuttled across the gut lining um, by the bacteria and dumped into our bloodstream or into our nervous system, and they go on throughout the body to protect us against infection, to help to make sure that vitamins and minerals get circulated around the body appropriately, they are um, uh, intimately, as I said, involved in your immune system and supporting your immune system. Um, they regulate how fat is metabolized and deposited, deposited, which is really important for weight gain or weight loss. They um, communicate with the brain, which we're gonna talk about here in a, in a second. And something really important, um, this number six off to the left here, this SCFA stands for short chain fatty acid production which only comes from the fermentation of fiber. Maria will address that um, a little bit in her lecture, but this is one of the predominant reasons why we need to eat uh, um, predominantly a plant-based diet is because of this fiber and being made into by the bacteria into something called a short chain fatty acid. And these short chain fatty acids communicate directly with your immune system. Now, I wanted to spend a couple minutes here talking about, you know, what we eat and why we choose what we eat. And much of what's on our plates during the day is determined by culture and cultural influences. Um, we eat often out of convenience. And, you know, what does the word convenient mean? It means different things to different people. Some people, it means going through the drive through of a fast food um, restaurant. Others, it means convenient going out to dinner at night so they don't have to cook. And others, it means like, what can I throw on my lunch bag that takes two seconds or less so I can get out the door? You know, everyone has their own interpretation of what
We lost your sound, Dr. Sonor. Way into health and wellness. And that is a really important topic we need to address today. And uh, Maria will also get into this a little bit with her talk, but our foods need to be whole foods and not packaged processed foods. Um, there are many ingredients that are put in processed foods that will drive inflammation, will um, disrupt the harmony between our immune system and our microbes and go on to possibly create a chronic disease. So what types of things do we do um, during Dr. Swinor, we lost you again. I think, Ashley, I think she's- well, The side of all of these lifestyle modifiers, if we are doing up, eating a high healthy diet or we have uncontrolled stress, and we don't exercise regularly and we indulge in excessive use of tobacco or alcohol and we have irregular sleep patterns. Does this sound like anybody here in our audience? Um, I know we all experience stress. We may um, eat some unhealthy foods at times and may not exercise as well as we should and um, definitely sleep for me. I know that's not um, well uh, organized in my life. So, all of these things disrupt the gut microbiome and can potentially lead to uncontrolled inflammation that goes on to drive um, disease. And um, in regards to the diet, as I stated, eating predominantly a whole food plant-based diet is vitally important to these microbes. They are dependent on this fiber for their own um, proliferation and building diversity. With di the word diversity means having many, many different types of bacteria. Um, studies have shown that the more diverse the microbiome is, the healthier the individual is. And that means avoiding added sugars, processed foods, processed fats, and foods with added sodium. This goes back to that slide that I was talking about convenience. All four of these um, nutrients here are often found in convenient foods and um, fast foods. And one particular food that all four of these are found in um, is bread. And how often do you have bread during the day? Many of us have maybe one slice, two slice. Um, you know, bread is used as a transportation of whatever is sandwiched in between it to get to our mouth. Doesn't mean that it's a healthy, um, healthy food choice. Um, there are some breads, however, um, that are healthier than others. Um, so just trying to avoid added sugars, processed, um, processed foods, processed white flour, um, added fats, and added sodium. And let's switch now to talking about the gut microbiome and its connection to our brain. We actually have two brains. We have our brain that, that's in our head, but we also have a brain that we refer to as the second brain in our gut, which is um, our digestive system. So we call this the gut brain axis and the gut brain axis has tremendous impact on our health and wellness and our activities and our stamina throughout the day. So the brain has influence on the gut as far as weight gain, bowel movements, um, delivering nutrition to it throughout the body and maintaining um, microorganism uh, diversity. And then the gut in return has influence on the brain with modulating neurotransmitters. We'll talk about that here in a second. Driving stress, anxiety and depression and mood and behavior. And how does this communication take place? Um, if you look up here in the top, we have the brain, and then we have this nerve exiting the brain, the brain stem here. It's cranial nerve 12, it's called the vagus nerve. And this, we call this nerve the wanderer as it wanders and meanders throughout the entire body. It has these tentacles that wrap around most of your organs throughout the body. And this is how your brain can, can, can directly communicate with these organs. But if you come all the way down here to the bottom, we see the small intestine, the large intestine. And this is like an elevator shaft. What's going on inside the bowel can directly send messages quickly right up this nerve back to the brain and vice versa. And when Ryan talks about his talk today, he's going to talk about 
um, breathing and relaxation that directly communicates with this vagus nerve. So I'm excited to hear his chat here in a few minutes. Or Dr. Gauthier, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Um, this slide illustrates um, extrinsic factors. Those are, that's your environment. The word extrinsic means what's happening on outside the body. So we have diet, lifestyle modification, which we've defined and talked about, uh, potential pathogens that can cause an infection, and also a very important thing that's out of the scope for us to talk about today, but maybe we'll be invited back someday to talk about um, neonatal health and in utero development and how that influences the gut microbiome and how that um, has potential to influence the infants and the child's life throughout their entire life and possibly increase the risk um, of disease later in life or not, depending on how healthy their, the child's microbiome is. Um, intrinsic factors are what's going on inside your body, your genes, and your gene, 80% um, of your genes can be modulated by the environment. And only about 20% of your genes are actually set in place, like the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, et cetera. But 80% have the potential to be manipulated by your lifestyle and what it is that you are doing. And then we've talked again about your immune system and hormones. So all of this information is fed into the gut and then via either your bloodstream or the vagus nerve that I was talking about, it goes back to the nerve, excuse me, your brain, and then your brain from its information coming from the gut then has tremendous impact on your cerebrovascular um, um, sorry, um, system, which then can pr promote atherosclerosis, multiple sclerosis, um, autoimmune diseases, um, your pain and migraines and anxiety and depression are all modulated through the gut. And then uh, dementia is also linked back to gut health, which is a whole other also discussion of interest that sometime we might want to come back and talk about is preventing dementia. Um, and did you know that 90%, 90% of your feel-good hormone, which is serotonin, which we're going to talk about here in a second, um, is made in the gut, 90%. So when you have, um, when you're feeling anxious or nervous and you have to go to the bathroom, um, this is one of the reasons because most of that hormone relies in your gut, not in your brain. And our mood hormones are norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Uh, we're going to, and they all overlap. They do not operate um, without overlapping with it with all the other hormones um, in, for your mood. And we're going to talk specifically here about serotonin. And serotonin is made from an amino acid, an essential amino acid. Essential means that you have to eat that or provide that. And there's amino acids called tryptophan. And tryptophan, we often think of, oh, that's in turkey, because after you eat Thanksgiving meal, you get really tired when you eat turkey. Well, actually, tryptophan is found much higher whoops, in plant-based foods, and it's a necessary um, precursor or feeder to making serotonin your feel-good hormone. We lost sound again. Can you hear me, Dr. Swinor? Ashley, can you help? I think it's a connection issue, um, oh, possibly. Yes. Oh, there we go. Oh, can you hear me there? Yeah. yeah we can okay. now. We yeah, lost you good. just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, can actually deplete your serotonin. So this gets into anxiety and depression and mood disorders. Um, when you are given um, an antidepressant, the antidepressant, 90% of that medication is actually working in the gut and 10% of it is actually working on in your brain. So it's really important to eat right, to try to avoid these emotions of anxiety, depression, um, et cetera, and try to avoid taking um, an antidepressant. Although, however, there are at times when, we, when um, medication is necessary um, and should be prescribed. And these are some great books um, on the mind-gut connection. Dr. Perlmutter's book, The Brain Maker, The Mind-Gut Connection by Dr. Emeryn Mayer, and then The Good Gut by Drs. Justin Sonnenberg and his wife, Erica Sonnenberg. 
And then to transition into the hormone cortisol, um, Dr. Gauthier was talking about this as well. Cortisol is considered our stress hormone. Cortisol comes from um, an adrenal the adrenal glands, which are um, right on top of our kidneys. They're about the size of a walnut and have tremendous impact in our overall health and wellness. Cortisol is involved in sugar metabolism. It's involved in blood pressure regulation, heart disease, or heart disease prevention. Um, it communicates directly with our immune system. So you've heard of flight or fright before. When, when you are in a chronic state of stress, the immune system is um, turned down or ramped down because I'm just going to use the analogy if you're being chased by a lion, you're not worried about catching a cold. So the immune system is pretty much really dampened down. And then we have cortisol that is ramped up. Well, high cortisol can go on then to cause poor sugar metabolism and digestive issues, nervous issues, anxiety, depression, et cetera. And then when you are in a relaxed state, which Dr. Gauthier would talk about, the cortisol calms down and your immune system turns back on. So it's so important, especially now during this pandemic, that we work on stress and relaxation and mind-body-spirit connection. And elevated cortisol, if you look over these lists here of the symptoms of high cortisol or low cortisol, I think most of us can say at some time or another we've experienced some of these um, symptoms like craving salty foods or sweet foods, um, feeling lightheaded or dizzy or chronically fatigued or having low energy or um, having sugar metabolism issues or retaining water, feeling bloated, et cetera. So all of these symptoms, um, can indicate whether you have too much cortisol, meaning you're really in a high state of stress, or you have too low cortisol, which could also mean that your body has been in a high state of stress for a long period of time and then no longer is able to produce enough cortisol, so you're experiencing symptoms of low cortisol. And um, just also, I'd like to mention uh, something that we see a lot of in our clinic, which is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The acronym for this is SIBO or SIBO. Um, SIBO uh, occurs uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, relevant to our conversation today, it can occur because of stress and anxiety, because when cortisol is ramped up, it slows down how quickly your um, bowel digests food. And food can hang around for a little longer than what it should be. And this allows for an opportunity for those microbes, which are mostly in your large bowel, to migrate up into the small bowel. Now, the job of these microorganisms is to ferment. So fermenting um, creates gas, and gas production um, in a closed space like your small bowel will create some bloating. So how often after a meal do you feel bloated or feel like, oh my gosh, I feel so full. There's no way I can fit another bite or morsel of food into my stomach. And maybe that bloating lasts throughout the day. You might have a little bit of nausea, chronic fatigue. Uh, you might also have excessive diarrhea after eating. All of these uh, symptoms here noted on the left could be related to something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And we're able to assess for this in our office and also have uh, treatment programs to help resolve this. And just um, in closing of uh, my talk here today, uh, it's so important to um, focus on the mind-gut connection. You can change your microbial organisms in your, um, in your gut through diet and lifestyle modification. These are not set in stone. Actually, 70% of this you can change throughout your adult life just by modulating your lifestyle. So that's a really important point here. And how can you modulate your gut micro, micro, microbes so that they communicate with your brain to keep you healthy and well is to eat predominantly plant-based foods. Um, again, the fiber that's in these foods feeds those bacteria and will help keep you healthy, keep your immune system strong and help present, prevent disease and prevent infection. And just in closing here, um, Henry Ford is doing a tremendous job to keep you safe and well and to uh, meet the needs of our patients and our communities. Um, they're 
We are offering the vaccine. It's not open to the public yet, um, but you can go to henryford.com slash vaccine to find out more information about the vaccine and when it would be available. And also today um, at one o'clock, there's going to be a Facebook Live Q&A and um, that's on COVID-19 vaccines, important facts at Henry Ford. Facebook Live. And then to schedule an appointment with our department, you can call the um, general scheduling line that's here on the screen, or you can go to henryford.com slash functional medicine. And Ryan's going to transition here. Dr. Galtier is going to transition here and talk to you about the mind-body uh, connection. And uh, we'll let you go for it. Dr. Valtier, thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you. That's some great information there. Um, there's a few things I want to mention before. We are going to do a short little um, guided meditation to help relax us, but I want to try to explain how that relates to this first. Um, you know, Chinese medicine, even functional medicine, um, acupuncture, massage, all look at the mind-body-spirit connection which means that the mind and body and spirit are all connected, they are not separate. So when one is in trouble, the others will soon follow. When one is healthy, the others will follow that as well. It, there's a saying that goes back thousands of years in Chinese medicine that where the breath goes, the mind will follow and the chi or the energy of the body will follow. From a modern standpoint, we look at that in biofeedback when we can actually control our breath, our blood pressure, our pulse rate, by actually being aware of how our breath um, moves within our body. There's been a lot of studies over the years about meditation um, and changing biomarkers within the body, whether those are um, the pulse and blood pressure or whether those are hormonal levels. And so when we do a meditation today, that's simple. It can be as simple as learning to breathe in and out and feeling that breath and feeling where it goes in your body, or it can be a guided thing that you can um, learn from what I'm teaching today, or you can find them on YouTube or Headspace, very easy applications to use. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is, um, how do we know when somebody is having issues with the mind-body connection or the gut-mind connection rather? A couple of things. We look at the bowel. Um, and this is big in Chinese medicine. And for thousands of years, we've asked patients, what does your bowel movement look like? What is the texture? What is the color? What is the consistency? Um, if you were to see Dr. Swinor, she'd run modern labs on those as well, which tells even more detailed information. But what we know is if you aren't going to the bathroom on a regular basis, there's something wrong with your digestive tract. And so when we make that jump to the mind-body connection, um, if you're stuck, in your physical body or with your bowel movement, you may also be stuck in your emotion. So any stagnation in the body is gonna cause stagnation in the whole system. And that can be seen through that vagus nerve connection and also through the circulatory system. Um, so the one thing I like to say is if you can't digest physically, you probably won't be able to digest emotionally. And so through meditation, through diet, through acupuncture, massage, um, these are all things that can help um, with that component of life as well as exercise. And after we're done with the meditation, I'll do a short segment on how acupuncture, chiropractic, and massage therapy can help in this situation. Um, so just a little bit so you guys know what perspective I'm coming from. I am a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. I'm a licensed massage therapist for over 20 years and I'm a trained clinical hypnotherapist. Um, I, with Dr. Swinor, help run the department at Henry Ford, and we have seven clinics between all the services we offer. So um, we have a wide variety of experience and we just wanna be able to bring that to the people listening today. So with that said, I'd like to take us into a guided meditation for a few minutes. Not very long, just stick with us. If you've never done this before, just try it out or just listen along if you don't feel like trying it out. So what I'd like you to do is either do a light gaze um, to a space by your computer or feel free to close your eyes for the next five minutes. Um, so we're just gonna take a deep breath in, 
and breathe out slowly, feeling the chest rise and fall, feeling how that air moves as we breathe in and out, how it touches the nose and the mouth. Breathing in naturally and fully, letting the stomach also rise and fall, giving ourselves a moment of quietness, just focusing on the first and last thing that we have in life, our breath, breathing in and out. Now with this breath, I'd like you to picture standing at the top of a beautiful stairwell. The stairwell can be marble or it can be wood. It doesn't really matter, just as long as we have eight steps. And as we begin to step down on the first step, we become more relaxed and more aware, breathing in and out, taking the steps slowly and comfortably. On the seventh step, you realize that your environment is letting go of all the stress that has come into your day, breathing in and out. And you take the sixth step, realizing that you are fully alive and fully relaxed and you can let go of things that are bothering you. And down to the fifth step and the fourth, breathing in and out. With each step down, you become more aware, more relaxed, more grounded and centered, breathing in and out. And we take the second, third step and the second step and as we arrive at the first step, we view out into a scene, a place maybe we grew up around that we enjoyed, a place we've traveled to that brought us comfort, joy, and relaxation, or a place we dream of going in the future. Now take that step into the scene as you breathe in and out. What do you feel? What do you hear? What do you see? It may be the scene of an ocean and you can hear the waves and feel the sand beneath your toes. You may be in a meadow and can see the bright flowers and feel the grass as you move along. Just take a moment to remember what it feels like to be in that space. Feel the warmth, the joy, the comfort and let yourself be in that moment, breathing in and out. And as we notice how we're feeling and noticing the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how of this scene, realize that at any point in your day, you can return to the spot of joy with your breath in and your breath out. That taking a moment to pause can bring you back here and reset your emotions breathing in and out. Now just take a moment of silence and observe that scene. And as you enjoy what you are feeling in the scene and remembering how you feel comfortable Slowly wiggle your fingers and toes and return to this talk, refreshed and revived and ready to learn. So thank you so much. So that was kind of a fast exercise, but I wanted to do something a little faster because what happens during our work day is we get overwhelmed by situations and circumstances, no matter what field we're in or the things going on with the virus and the things going on with social distancing, um, that we can just find a quiet spot and take three to five minutes of breathing and reset our entire day, which resets our emotions and then resets our hormones and bioresponses. And this is a very important thing to remember because even if you don't take those steps exactly like I showed them, just closing your eyes and thinking of a comfortable place and breathing can do the same exact result. Now, there has been a lot of research on meditation 
and bringing um, meditators, large groups, a million meditators into big cities for a period of time. And they realized that if 1% of the population meditated, they could change the crime rates in the city. And so what is shown is if we meditate 1% of our day, we can change our whole body and our whole outlook look on life. Well, 1% of our day is just 15 minutes. So thinking about how much time we make waste watching TV or um, having useless conversations or getting sucked into Facebook for hours, um, that 15 minutes could be more productive towards our whole overall health. And meditation does not have to be some big mystical thing. It's really with about returning to the breath and reconnecting the mind to the body. Um, so what I'd like to talk about briefly next is about acupuncture and massage and how they can help reduce stress. Um, we know that more than 40 million American adults have symptoms of, of anxiety and excessive worrying. Um, this can affect their everyday life and it's most commonly treated through psychotherapy and medication or a combination of both. But as we have been shown earlier today, these things can be treated through diet, through meditation. And now I'm about to share that they can also be helped through acupuncture and massage therapy. Um, there was a promising study in 2015 that found improved symptoms in people with anxiety who didn't respond to other treatments who tried out acupuncture. Now, this was a smaller study and acupuncture was given in 30 minute sessions over a 12 week period. And they did compare it to sham acupuncture as a control, um, but they showed that they were able to help reduce anxiety up to 10 weeks with this course of session. Now, being that it is a small study, there is more work to be done, but there is promise within the scientific research around anxiety and acupuncture. Another study that was done in an animal study, um, showed that acupuncture could be effective at um, combating the fight or flight response. And that's a response Dr. Swinor talked about with the cortisol levels in the body, where your body tightens up and it either chooses to fight or run away. Well, acupuncture can actually help that. Um, some people get stuck in a chronic loop of this fight or flight. And through getting acupuncture, they can help to break that loop where they are not having this fight or flight response when they shouldn't be having it. Um, there was also another group that was tested the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So that's basically the top number and bottom number you're given when you go to your doctor. Um, and they were able to show for a 24 hour period after getting acupuncture, the blood pressure was reduced. Now, long-term, they aren't able to show that yet, but we do know that acupuncture has that um, reduction on the biomarkers and it's a very positive thing. So the other thing is acupuncture's mechanism is still not known by science because we know that it um, affects a bunch of different areas of the body. We know that it affects the nervous system, the dermatomes through the skin. We know that it affects circulation and we know that it can affect hormone outputs. And so studying acupuncture as a general response is very hard because we often try to study a single one of those areas when all of those are going on at one time when you put in an acupuncture needle. With that said, there are some very positive studies about how acupuncture can help depression and anxiety. And while we're on that point, how do you know besides your bowel movement if you have um, issues with a mind-body connection? And those include being headachy, feeling um, sleepy all the time, feeling tired after meals, um, and just feeling like your emotions can spike at any given time. Those are all signs that you may have something going on with your gut connection and need to have some adjustments. So, Quickly, I'd like to go over um, some information on massage. There was a 2006 study in massage on hospitalized psychiatric patients. Um, they were given 20 minutes of massage therapy offered each day that they were hospitalized, and it was able to be shown that their anxiety levels were actually reduced from the massage therapy when compared to people not getting the massage. And then the next one was done on emergency room nurses. They identified that these nurses have high stress jobs as we all can imagine, and that they dealt with anxiety on a personal level often related to their work. 
they were given 12 weeks of massage therapy with aromatherapy and music. And the results of 365 massages given compared to the non-massage groups showed that the anxiety levels and coping skills were, I mean, the anxiety was lower and their coping skills were increased through just getting regular massage therapy. Um, so I just, you know, there's lots of other information out there on massage and acupuncture. The other thing I would mention is chiropractic. These three things can help reduce pain. Many Americans are suffering from pain and they turn to very dangerous medications. And we have an opioid epidemic in the US that um, we can help address pain in a way that, um, that is more natural and doesn't have such dangerous medications. And this, you know, the combination of the nutrition and these things can help um, when there's pain, it can cause anxiety. When there's anxiety, people will often eat worse. Um, and the medications can also affect the gut health that they're taking. And so by using more natural methods to address pain in itself can actually help um, prevent some of these um, gut bacteria issues that may come from the anxiety or from eating badly or from the medications related to the pain. Because as we know, um, eating can be a coping mechanism. And we often do not turn to good foods when we're using that coping mechanism. So, you know, I just wanted to be able to share today about meditation, acupuncture, massage, and chiro, and just give you a little overview. But now I'm going to turn it over to Maria, who's going to give us a more detailed idea on nutrition. Everyone, I'm going to take a couple minutes and just um, highlight and reinforce some of the things that Dr. Sonor and Ryan uh, already mentioned about diet and nutrition. So let me pull my screen up here. Okay, do you see it? Okay, so let's see. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight, you know, some of the ways that we can nourish our gut, feed that good bacteria, um, promote bacterial or microbial balance in the gut through food. So like Dr. Swinor mentioned, you know, our standard American diet is not a gut nourishing diet. It's not the type of diet that's going to help support uh, mental wellness or reduce chronic inflammation um, or just help us cope with our stressful lifestyles. Um, the standard American diet is, is high in very refined foods and processed foods. Dr. Swinor touched on the um, added ingredients, the um, preservatives and additives that we find in these foods. Um, it's, it's high in added sugars. And if it doesn't have added sugar, then it usually seems to have an artificial sweetener added. And those are not friendly to our gut either. Um, also high in sodium. It's also going to be a significant source of saturated fat and refined oils in the diet. And those, are, um, those have pro-inflammatory effects on our body. And then it brings along a lot of calories with it but even with a lot of calories, we're not necessarily getting a lot of nutrition to go along with that. So the opposite of that, you know, Dr. Sonor had mentioned what type of things do we need to try and eat uh, more of, and those are our plant-based foods. And so there's, there's a few reasons, there's lots of reasons that we wanna maximize those in the diet, but a few that I'm gonna highlight specifically to nourishing the gut. So the first thing is fiber. She had talked about trying to get more fiber into our diet to feed um, our gut. Another one's gonna be more whole foods. And so this is going to be the opposite of those highly processed and refined products. And then rainbow of color. You know, when we touch on uh, mental wellness, when we touch on trying to eat foods that reduce chronic inflammation in the body, that reduce disease risk, we're gonna start thinking about that rainbow of color. So for fiber, we're generally trying to aim towards 20 on the low side, upwards to 40 grams of fiber a day. Uh, most Americans are getting somewhere between 10 and 15. And so when we just focus in on that specific statistic, um, it's no wonder that so many of us do suffer with a lot of symptoms and issues uh, that can be stemmed back towards our gut. Plant-based foods are naturally uh, a source of fiber in the diet. And so that's going to take us to vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Uh, you may have heard the term prebiotic. Uh, those are foods that good bacteria likes to eat in the gut. 
And so we wanna make sure that we incorporate as many plant-based foods as possible to keep that friendly bacteria happy and well-fed. I like to think of it as if we're not feeding the beneficial bacteria, then we're probably feeding uh, the unfriendly bacteria. I wanna put a little bit of emphasis on these legumes because when I talk to patients um, throughout the day and week, this is something that's not showing up in a lot of people's diet on a very regular basis. Um, some people tell me they may eat these once a month or less, um, or maybe just you know here and there as, a, as an ingredient for a special meal that they may eat once in a while. And so if you're looking to try and boost fiber intake in your diet and looking to try to increase prebiotic for the friendly bacteria in your gut during the day, this is something that I wanna challenge you to incorporate on a regular basis. Aim towards half a cup or a cup a day. If that's not something that you're used to consuming these types of foods, you may wanna start small. So maybe just start with an eighth of a cup or a fourth of a cup and work your way up as your body begins to adjust um, to consuming these on a more regular basis. When it comes to fiber, you know, in half a cup, we're looking at six to eight grams per half a cup serving. There's not many other food groups that you're gonna find that much fiber in in such a compact amount of serving. So a few suggestions as we think about, you know, our meals in the day and our snacks in the day. I pulled um, some beautiful pictures from some different uh, websites and recipe bloggers. So we see here on the left, we have uh, chickpeas that have been added to a salad. And some people, you know, when they do salads, they just focus on some leafy greens, maybe a few vegetable toppings, a simple way to upgrade that salad, to add some protein to that salad, to increase the fiber in that salad could be even as simple as just opening canned beans, rinsing them off, uh, you reduce some of the added sodium that way, and then adding them as a topping to that salad. Uh, the second picture here, we have a vegetable platter with some hummus. So hummus comes from chickpeas, and that's still part of that legume family. So um, a lot of people, when they do their hummus, they tend to grab pita chips, or they grab uh, pita bread made with white flour, or they may grab you know, other, other um, packaged snack foods or refined grains to eat that hummus with. So an upgrade to that type of snack would be to actually substitute some of those uh, refined carbohydrates and highly processed carbohydrates with vegetables, just plain you know, simple vegetables. People tend to buy these things, but it's not uncommon for them to tell me it goes bad and then it ends up in the trash because they don't really even though it's in the fridge, they're not always going to eat it. So make that healthier choice the easier choice. If you don't tend to take the time to wash them, cut them, clean them, um, then buy the ones that are already cut and cleaned for you so that it'll be more enticing for you just to grab them um, and eat them as a snack. The other thing would be is pull them up out from the, you know, the vegetable or the produce bins in your fridge because we're not always opening those as regularly as every time we open that refrigerator door. So put it somewhere that you're going to see it and that you're going to be cued to actually consume it. Um, you know, a lot of people are working from home right now and they mention midday or all throughout the workday that they feel like they're just snacking all day long and it's kind of derailing them towards their health goals. So I think a simple idea would be to maybe somewhere between 10, 3 p.m. in that snacking period pull out a plate, you know, lay out some hummus or, or something like that, and then put some vegetables on that plate so that as you're moving around the kitchen or moving around your house, rather than going into the pantry to back to grab more tortilla chips or pita chips um, or cookies or crackers, you know, you'll be more enticed to actually consume what you have already laid out. And then the last picture here, we have this beautiful picture of chili. Um, and this is just to kind of remind us that you may already have meals that you enjoy eating that incorporate some kind of bean, pea, or lentil. And so, you know, kind of take stock of that and start to rotate those throughout your week more often as a way to increase the prebiotics in your diet, um, increase the fiber in your diet, <clears throat> excuse me, and overall anti-inflammatory foods in your diet. So I mentioned, you know, whole foods. So I think there's an opportunity to increase the whole foods that we're consuming in the day at every meal and snack. Um, when we think about our, our meals and we're using grains, a lot of us, Dr. Sonora talked about bread. How often are we eating bread? And not that bread is a bad food, but 
sometimes we're eating more bread and flour products rather than actually eating the whole intact grain. And so I think that's a way to upgrade your carbohydrates is rather than get rid of them totally, which, which sometimes we believe is the solution um, to uh, you know, losing weight or meeting some of our health goals is think about how can you upgrade those carbohydrates that you're already eating. So you know, there's, a big, there's a big world out there of, of whole intact grains that many of us don't, aren't used to consuming. And so in this picture here, we have uh, short grain brown rice, we have wild rice. Uh, I see some uh, old fashioned oats here. And so think about how can I actually eat more grains that I have to chew, um, that I am gonna prepare and cook rather than pick bread and crackers um, and refined grains like white rice and white pasta. We also see on the slide here, fruit. Fruit and either natural nut butters or fruit and nuts or seeds. This doesn't require much time and it's a lot more nutritious than some of the energy bars or granola bars that many of us are replacing snacking on whole fruit with um, in place of. And so, you know, this would just be a reminder is it doesn't take a lot of time to pull out an apple, spread some nut butter on it, or to put together a small bowl of berries or fruit with some of your favorite nuts or seeds. That's gonna be um, a, a more nutritional boost into your day rather than choosing granola bars, crackers, energy bars, and so on. Now, realistically, we have the times that we want more indulgent foods. You know, we want those sweet treats. And I think there's even an opportunity to upgrade that on a regular basis when we, when we have, uh, when, we want, when we desire those foods. So I saw this. It looks so appealing to me. This is a uh, nice cream, which would be an alternative to some of the ice creams that we may find in the grocery store. I have some patients who say, um, you know, I do, I love ice cream and I buy it, but what ends up happening is I really wanted it, you know, on the weekend, but I had the rest of the pint left or I had the rest of the gallon of ice cream left in the refrigerator. And so I ended up eating it Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, throughout the rest of the week, even when I didn't necessarily want it as badly as I did the first time, but it's there, and so I eat it. And so, uh, you know, that's a common pothole, I think, that happens throughout the week when we have some of these really delicious, um, addicting snack foods in the house. So an alternative would be don't buy it as much as possible. Don't buy it. If you, if you decide to buy it, buy a very small portion so that it can't be repeated multiple times. Um, in a row, or you know, you could actually make your own uh, one serving dessert where you take something like frozen bananas, a plant-based milk, you could put cocoa powder in there, you could put natural nut butters in there, they put hazelnuts in these, and you can make a, a more, uh, a, an ice cream or an ice cream that's actually made with more whole ingredients. And it's not the type of thing that um, you have to worry about having a whole gallon around that's going to cause you to you know, eat a bowl of ice cream every single night before bed. So I mentioned, you know, eating the rainbow and those anti-inflammatory nutrients. One of the reasons that this rainbow of color, trying to fit that into our meals and our snacks and throughout our week is so powerful because we find over 25,000 different anti-inflammatory nutrients in plant-based foods. And so we hear about these superfoods, um, you know, leafy greens and acai and um, you know, cherries, and those are deeply colored plant-based foods. And the reason that sometimes they get the reputation of superfoods is because they're so high in different antioxidants. And you don't just have to eat those ones. It's really all about getting a variety. You can eat those as well as some of the more common, you know, ones like bell peppers and apples, you know, some very um, basic plant-based foods that we don't, that don't always get um, into the group of superfoods. So we want to get more color into our day, more color into our meal. Uh, this is going to help strengthen and support our immune system. Um, it's also going to provide protective benefits against diabetes, heart disease, certain cancers, um, strengthening the brain um, as we age, as well as improving and supporting mental health and wellness. So I challenge you, you know, the next, you're probably gonna have lunch maybe after this if you're not already eating. Um, how can you add more color into that meal? And it doesn't mean that you have to cook a lot more food. If we take a salad, um, you know, think about ways that you can put new combinations together that you may not normally do. 
it could be as simple as adding some fruit as a topping into that salad. You know, whether it's berries or whether you want to add uh, sliced apples or slices of pear or um, segments of orange into that salad, you're going to make it more colorful. You can add some nuts or seeds as a topping on that salad. That's going to add more colorful, um, more color, more, more color families into that meal. In the middle here, we have uh, somewhat of like a breakfast meal. So it looks like scrambled eggs, but it's actually scrambled tofu. Um, we see potatoes on that plate, and we also see some avocado and tomato. So what they've added to this dish to make it resemble more egg-like or scrambled egg-like is spices. And so turmeric is frequently used um, in this dish, or chili powder, or cumin. And so using herbs and spices is another way that you can boost up the phytonutrients in your meal, because those are also plant-based foods. And then here on the right, we have uh, a very popular um, snack, or sometimes it's a meal for some people, and that's this idea of toast. So we have uh, our avocado toast, we have our hummus toast, and that's another great alternative to doing bread with butter or a bagel with cream cheese. You know, you can upgrade those traditional snacks or meals with something like taking a good whole grain bread, adding hummus on it, or adding guacamole on it, or adding a smashed avocado on it. And then you'll see they put some seeds on there. Uh, they put a little bit of greens on there. And so just even these small toppings is gonna increase your phytonutrients in that milk. And then we have oatmeal here on the bottom. Um, I think it's done really well. Sometimes people just do oatmeal and water. And, and then they tell me they add uh, brown sugar to it or they buy flavored oatmeal packets. So we did, we did good by having oats in mind, but there's a way to do oats even better. And that's to add in all these wonderful different food groups. So it becomes a more well-rounded meal. Um, you can do plain oats. And I like to challenge people to flavor and season them themselves because you will put better ingredients in there at home than necessarily what we're finding in some of the flavored oatmeal packets. A lot of patients say, well, I get the low sugar uh, brown, you know, I get the low sugar maple syrup flavored oatmeal packets. Well, what we find is that they may have taken out some of the sugar, but then they've added in artificial sweeteners. And that's not necessarily an upgrade to that milk. So this is actually oats and quinoa cooked. And then they added some spices to that. Um, they added some fruit to that some nuts and seeds to that. And so that's taken something that has a lot of good carbohydrates and they added good plant-based protein to that as well as heart healthy fat to that. And that's gonna allow that meal to become more satisfying all longer. Maria, I'm just, I just wanna jump in for one second. We're just a little bit over our time. I just wanna make sure um, we get to the questions. So do you think you can wrap maybe after yep. this slide? Okay. Yep. So this is actually the last slide right here. Thank so, you, you know, um, not only it's, is it important of what we eat, but even thinking about how we're eating. And so, you know, being kind to our gut, we don't always think about that in a meal. I love what Ryan brought in and talked about um, having these meditative moments to slow down throughout the day. That's a really great approach to try and set yourself up for a great eating experience at each meal. Stress eating is common. Um, eating out of boredom is common. Emotional eating, very, very common. And so sometimes if we just take a few moments before that meal to just kind of reset ourselves and um, remove the distractions, turn off the TV, move away from the laptop, move away from the computers, trying to keep as much respect and as much of a relaxed environment as possible um, while we're eating can truly make a big impact um, on how much we eat, how satisfied we feel after our meals, and even how well our body digests the food. Um, so I, I'll put that out there. A few other things to do is to think about, you know, trying to consume more calories earlier in the day. You know, that's gonna be beneficial to our metabolism, beneficial to, um, to preparing our gut for rest at nighttime. So, you know, don't make breakfast or lunch necessarily the lightest meal of the day, because a lot of times it sets people up to eat heavier dinners. And then sometimes leads into snacking at nighttime. And so if we redo that, over time, your body will adjust to getting used to that. Um, and then trying to also incorporate an overnight fast. So a period of eating of somewhere between 12 and 16 hours, where after you have your uh, dinner, you, you let your digestive system do what it needs to do at nighttime to begin to prepare for the next day, restore um, 
um, and do all the all the good work it's doing, you know, to clean up, you know, clean up food and clean out and move your system along. Okay, okay, Nicole. Great, thank you. That was all of you were so I was I was fascinated. Um, so we got a few questions from our audience. I don't know if we can get to all of them, but I'm going to ask you a couple and let you guys just kind of riff. So I lost a couple of my questions when I logged off accidentally, but, uh, one that I did remember someone asked about yeast and, um, the growth of yeast in your body. So if you have like an overgrowth, I guess an, she was referring to an overgrowth of yeast, but how long does it take for your body to kind of flush that out and heal? Um, I can address that one. It can take several weeks to several months. And we do have a whole candida uh, treatment protocol um, that we initiate for patients that have confirmed yeast um, candida infections or systemic yeast infections. And uh, we have uh, several methods of assessing if that's um, really a true infection or not before we initiate any treatment protocols. But to answer the question directly, it can take six weeks, nine, you know, up to nine weeks, and even longer than that, uh, depending on um, the patient's um, overall general health. Okay, great. And, and gut health. And I think I'll give a fast analogy just mm -hmm. to support that. Um, in the gut, there's only so much surface area. So bad um, growth and good growth compete for the same area. So if you think about having an apartment where it's filled with bad roommates, it takes a little while to evict them all before you can get the good roommates back in. And so you can think about the same thing with gut health. And then just to jump off from what Dr. Gauthier just said is that, you know, what feeds yeast is poor nutrition, high sugar, refined sugars, processed flours, many of the things that Maria touched on in her presentation. Um, to avoid yeast would be to remove those types of foods from, from the diet and not to remove whole foods and fiber and a high fiber diet. Great. Great. Um, so the next question kind of jumps off that. So we're talking about all the things we should eat, which is a lot of fiber, legumes, whole grains, et cetera. What do you do for, what do you recommend for people who can't maybe ingest a lot of fiber because they have say IBD or someone who gets bloated when they eat too many beans? So how do you sort of account for all that? Uh, so we touched, I think all of us kind of touched on that a little bit. Again, assessing for what's the underlying uh, cause of why you cannot tolerate those types of foods. And basically, I like to use the analogy of a garden. Um, you may not have a diverse microbiome or microbiota to be able to process those heavy, dense, um, rich foods that are um, loaded with fiber because you don't have the microbiota present to break them down. Uh, so avoiding them is, is not the treatment. Actually doing the opposite and assessing what the problem is and um, slowly introducing those uh, foods back into the diet so you can proliferate a healthy microbiome to reverse um, any underlying cause of disease or why you can't tolerate them in the first place. And also you mentioned, Nicole, IBD, um, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and colitis. Actually, one of the underlying treatments um, to put those diseases in remission is actually fiber. And if a patient is in an active, um, active state of Crohn's or colitis, then a low residue diet or a low fiber diet is recommended. But the long-term treatment for that is actually to get them to be able to eat whole food um, plant-based uh, diet as much as possible to proliferate the healthy bacteria so the healthy bacteria can heal the gut lining, which is the problem. Got it. Mm -hmm. Great. That was pretty much it. I mean, we did get a question about intermittent fasting, but you just kind of touched on that. Um, so I think we'll, this is a great place to wrap. Um, I just want to thank you guys, our wonderful panelists, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, and thank you to our audience for coming and listening. And I hope this leaves you feeling inspired to be nice or at least nicer to your gut. Um, it is lunchtime, so I hope you go eat something good for lunch. Um, and by good, I mean healthy. And um, we'll send that video around. Um, in, to everyone, um, as well as the recording, we're going to have the recording of this um, panel on our site. And if you're also, if you're interested in reading the story on gut health from our January issue, you can also find that on our website, which is seenthemagazine.com. Um, so thank you again to all of you and everyone have a wonderful, healthy weekend. <laughs>